Okay, hello. Cool, it's uh, good to see a full house here. Um, I'm Luke, I'm the CTO at Cluster HQ, and um, I thought I'd do something a little bit different for the first half of this talk. Um, it's going to be less about tech and, and more about a story that I want to tell you, which relates to tech, but um, it's the story about how we managed to get uh, volume plugins into Docker. And this was a, a story that involved um, lots of different people in lots of different time zones, lots of trips to San Francisco and back, and uh, I, I hope it's interesting. And then for the second half of the talk, I'm, I'm going to sort of do a deep dive into some, some demos and some live demos, if my 4G holds out, um, of uh, some examples of what you can do with volume plugins, uh, and in particular, our volume plugins. So um, it, if you sort of cast your minds back to the summer of 2014, uh, sort of the, the uh, balmy days of the beginning of the container explosion and everyone was going crazy about Docker. And, and we decided to focus our business at that time on solving data problems for Docker. We noticed that there was a, a big gap in the container ecosystem for dealing with uh, what we call stateful containers or, or containers, for example, that have databases in them that want to write to files on disk or something like that. And so we were putting our heads together and figuring out, well, how can we solve data problems for Docker? But there was something that stood in our way of just like going ahead and solving that problem. Um, and, and that was the fact that there wasn't really anywhere in the stack for our thing that we wanted to build to fit. So um, if you look at a typical container stack, it, it might look something a little bit like this, vastly simplified, but this is something what uh, something like what Docker Swarm would look like uh, running against a set of container hosts. So at the top, you've got something that does orchestration and scheduling. Um, this can come in many different instantiations. You can have a, a Docker Swarm with Compose, or you could have a Kubernetes, or you could have a, a Mesosphere with Marathon, and I'm sure you'll hear lots more about those today. Um, but uh, in, in abstract, it looks like there's something that controls a set of hosts, and then there's a set of hosts where you have the Docker daemon running, and uh, the Docker daemon is where you actually run your processes, like your, your workloads, your app that you're trying to schedule onto this, onto this cluster. So this is sort of roughly the picture of how people are trying to do uh, containers in production. And so we came along, and we were like, well, let's, let's try and solve some storage problems here. There aren't good ways of running stateful containers um, in production, so let's try and solve that. Um, and we also had uh, a bunch of people in the ecosystem, like our friends at Weave in London, uh, trying to solve networking problems, and they had exactly the same problem. And to be clear, what the problem was, was that in order to be able to uh, run, uh, in order to be able to do anything useful with stateful containers with Flocker at the time, we had to wrap the Docker CLI. And what that meant was uh, that if you wanted to spin up a stateful container and then move it from one machine to another, you had to type something like Flocker deploy and then, uh, uh, and then Flocker deploy, the command, would go and talk to the, uh, the Docker daemons on each machine uh, using the Docker API. But um, the problem was that if you wanted to use Weave, to, which provided networking solutions so that your containers could talk to each other, then you had to use the weave command, the weave run. And you couldn't use both. <laughs> so you couldn't weave run and, uh, uh, and Flocker deploy um, the same application because you just had to choose which command you were going to use. So we had this problem that wrapping sucked because you couldn't compose things when you wrapped them. Um, so we put our heads together um, and, uh, and started trying to figure out this, this problem. And then something that, for the purposes of this project, was actually kind of lucky happened, which was that in December 2014, uh, CoreOS launched a rocket. Or more accurately, they launched a project called Rocket, um, which was, a, which was sort of positioned as a competitor to Docker. Uh, this had everyone in a bit of a tiz. <laughs> Uh, in the ecosystem and everyone was talking about, oh, well, what's going to happen with this? Why are they doing it? But what this did was it applied some pressure to Docker Inc. to figure out how they can 
Uh, well, so let me backtrack a little bit. So, so what was happening at this time was that there was the sense of in in the ecosystem of well, Docker aren't playing nice with their own ecosystem. Um, they're moving from being a container runtime to being the, the complete stack. And well, wait, we're trying to solve bits of the problems in the stack. So um, why can't why can't we have a go? Uh, and so the in conjunction with the with the rocket announcement, uh, which I think. Um, to be fair to Alex Polvey, or maybe unfair to him, I, I was pretty nasty timing. He announced it just as the entire Docker team were heading on a plane uh, to Amsterdam for <laughs> DockerCon EU. So um, that that was a bit mean. Um, but uh, this led to a sense of pressure on Docker and a sense that Docker had to do something to demonstrate that they were up for building this composable ecosystem. Um, and so uh, I was fortunate enough to get to sit in a room um, at DockerCon EU in Amsterdam with a bunch of people who wanted to talk about plugins. And of course, I wanted to talk about plugins as well because we were tackling this, we were bat battling this exact same problem. Um, and so uh, you can see um, uh, this was a, a pretty disorganized room on what the side of the uh, of the conference center in Amsterdam. Um, this. Uh, this tweet, when I tweeted out this picture, it became a little bit uh, popular, and everyone was referring to the uh, the DockerCon kettle, um, which they thought was hilarious for some reason. Um, and uh, we've got Solomon Hikes in this picture, the CTO at Docker. We've got um, Alexis Richardson from Weave, uh, who uh, set up this meeting and was pivotal in sort of pushing this this thing forwards. Um, and we've also got Darren from Rancher over there, along with Ben from Docker, uh, previously um, uh, Fig, and, um, and a bunch of people from VMware. And lots of people got together, and they were interested in, in solving this problem. And so um, this was an opportunity to get involved and, in some sense, sort of take a lead in, um, in forging this, this plugin system. And there was much discussion and much debate um, to begin with, people couldn't even decide what protocol the plugin system should speak um, to the things that wanted to plug into it. Uh, lots of people had lots of far too clever ideas, in my opinion, about all sorts of interesting protocols to use. And in the end, uh, we managed to uh, agree on um, uh, JSON over HTTP over a Unix socket, which is about as simple as you can get. But what we did was we built this plugin mechanism. and. Um, so over the, I guess, nine months that followed, uh, we managed to get consensus that plugins should exist on a per host basis, because that makes them independent to whichever orchestration system you're using. Um, and that there should be slots for networking plugins and, and, and storage plugins, or volume plugins. Um, and just to summarize what they do, the networking plugins allow uh, containers in a cluster to communicate with each other, um, and the storage plugins allow containers in a cluster to refer to a specific named volume that will follow that container around if it gets rescheduled or moved between different uh, containers. And these are both, hopefully, obviously, uh, things that you would want to be able to do uh, in a cluster of containers. It brings containers a little bit closer to <laughs> Uh, having the sort of level of manageability that you that you get that you already have with virtual machines and lots of uh, very mature stacks around around virtualization. Um, and there were three things that I kept banging on about as being important if this plugin project was going to succeed. Um, the first one was that the plugins needed to needed to be late bound. So what late bound means is uh, that they can't be compiled into Docker. Because the way that people get Docker is they download them from their package repository on Ubuntu, or, or they, uh, uh, they install something on OS X. I mean, we can't expect all the plugins in the ecosystem to uh, be compiled in and shipped with Docker. And, uh, and, and we can't depend, we can't make their uh, release schedules depend on Docker's release schedules either, because we might want to put a new version of Flocker out. And we don't want to have to be beholden to, to Docker to do that. They need to be composable, which means you need to be able to load more than one of them. Like that was the whole point of the wrapping problem. We wanted to be able to load uh, Swarm, sorry, uh, Weave and Flocker, both as plugins. And they needed to be optional. So uh, Docker's sort of mantra in response to um, 
this pressure was uh, from the ecosystem was uh, batteries included but removable, which is kind of a weird metaphor, but okay, like you don't normally swap out, swap out a battery for a different shaped battery, but whatever. Um, uh, the point is that if Docker are shipping their own batteries, they need to be implemented using the same plug-in mechanism that uh, third-party vendors are, are implementing. And um, my idea, my thesis, was that if we managed to do this, then we'd end up with a healthy ecosystem with lots of innovation around uh, ways of extending the Docker ecosystem. And um, to a large extent, we succeeded. Um, but I'll talk about a few more steps along the way first, because it wasn't a slam dunk, and it certainly wasn't easy. Uh, so this is a picture uh, taken in a hut in Austria, uh, where I was fortunate enough to go and hang out with Ilya from Weave here. Um, and so we got together um, in Austria, of all places, and uh, we together jointly developed a project called PowerStrip. And what PowerStrip was, was a way of like I said, sort of trying to take a leadership position in, 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 in this discussion a little bit by saying, okay, well, honestly, we were trying to put a bit of pressure on, on Docker themselves to say, um, well, if, if you don't build an extension mechanism, we will. And I wasn't trying to be like horrible about it. We were just trying to get this done. So what we did was we, we developed PowerStrip. And PowerStrip was a mechanism just for prototyping Docker, ext Docker extensions. And so the way it worked was, um, excuse the fairly ugly diagram, but um, the, the, the Docker client at the bottom here um, uh, would be something like the Docker CLI, or it would be Swarm, or um, even Kubernetes or something else that talks the uh, the Docker remote API. Uh, just FYI, the Docker remote API is how the Docker client talks to the Docker server. So if you type Docker run, what's actually happening is that the Docker client, which is running on your machine, is potentially talking to a Docker server that's somewhere else. It might be running on your machine. It might be running somewhere else. Um, and it it's that that is uh, um, sort of HTTP sort of JSON over HTTP. And I don't have enough time in this talk to talk about all the differences and the weird tweaks that we had to do to get this working. But um, the Docker client would talk uh, to what it thought was um, the Docker daemon. And in fact, it would get sidetracked. It would get, uh, it, it would actually be connecting to PowerStrip. So we'd make PowerStrip bind to like uh, the, the Docker port or var on docker.stock or something. And then um, PowerStrip would allow you to run a set of pre-hooks, um, which could delay the request and could also mutate the contents of the request. And then uh, it would send the request onto the Docker server. And uh, the request could also be mutated on the way, or the response could also be mutated or delayed on the way back. And it turned out that this fairly straightforward extension mechanism, like being able to say, before you start a container, move this volume in place, or before you start a container, set up this network, or before you shut down a container, tear down the network, or after you shut down the container, tear down the network, that sort of thing. Um, this was sufficient to prototype uh, Weave and Flocker plugins amongst, uh, amongst some others. Um, and so uh, in that hut in Austria, Ilya and I got uh, Flocker and Weave plugins working uh, for the very first time in a composable way using PowerStrip. And we put a blog post out about it and, and it got some attention. Um, and, and that was really, that was the push that we needed to, to really get on and build this. It gave everyone in the, involved in the project the incentive to like, come on, hurry up, we need to get this done by DockerCon, um, otherwise we're wasting our time here. So uh, I just wanted to shout out to a few people who were really instrumental um, in making this happen. Um, uh, first up, Solomon Hikes at Docker, bottom right. Um, he met with me when I went over to San Francisco. Um, he was uh, very amenable to this. When I showed him PowerStrip for the first time, I thought he might be annoyed, but he was actually like, no, this is great, let's, let's do it. Um, and sort of he gave his blessing to, to, to publish it as an open source project. Although he did make us change the word plugin to adapter because he wanted to keep the word plugin um, in the search results, which is fair enough. Um, then we had um, uh, Michael Bridgen um, at Weave. 
I couldn't actually find a picture of him. He's a very elusive chap, but there's a picture of a fox instead. Um, and uh, he worked tirelessly to help us develop this, uh, this mechanism and, and was involved on the networking side, which honestly was a lot hairier than the storage side. Um, Patrick Channison at Docker was incredibly helpful at just getting stuff organized and getting us meetings. Um, David Calavera helped on the actual volume plugin implementation and refactored a lot of the Docker code. Uh, Jeff Lindsay uh, at Glider Labs got involved about halfway through the project, um, actually earlier, uh, and, and he had a keen interest in making Docker extensible, and, and that was incredibly helpful. Um, then our very own uh, uh, Kai Davenport, Bino Carlos, on Twitter um, did an awesome job of, uh, of getting involved. He actually wrote the, uh, the, fir the Weave power strip, the power strip Weave adapter, um, that, that we finally got working together. Um, that, was, that was awesome. And then, of course, uh, Michael Crosby uh, at Docker was also involved in the actual implementation of the volume plugins. And, uh, and Arno um, at Docker uh, was awesome as a point of contact. I mean, those guys were frantically trying to juggle a million different things, and they made this happen. So, like, huge respect to them. Um, so, we got this all working, just about. Um, the, uh, the actual Docker plugin mechanism got created in those last weeks before, uh, before the DockerCon deadline that we had set ourselves. Uh, so this was for DockerCon um, in uh, June last year um, in San Francisco. And um, the reason I've got a picture of the escalators at Heathrow on this slide is that um, Kai and I were frantically trying to finish off um, the, the demo for the Docker plugins demo, uh, which we were due to um, uh, present on stage together on the Monday. This was the Saturday, Saturday night uh, we got a flight. Um, and things were still changing up to the last, very last minute. Uh, Docker decided that they didn't want to have dash dash net equals weave. Instead, they wanted to have dash dash, uh, I can't even remember, some other obscure uh, flag for publishing things onto a, Weave, onto a, onto a plug in enabled network. And so um, Kai and I were rushing down the escalators. I had um, a, a hotspot on my phone, and he was building a vagrant box on his laptop, which was closed in his bag. As, and we were like, don't go too far away from the Wi-Fi, otherwise we'll, the Vagrant build will fail. So, um, and I also want to say thank God for, um, uh, for the Wi-Fi on the plane, because things were changing um, up to the last minute. On, so United have Wi-Fi, even though United is pretty terrible, they do have Wi-Fi. And we were able to stay in touch with the Weave team on the ground as things were changing um, up to the last minute. But we got it working, and Kai did an incredible job of uh, patching swarm and compose on the plane to support the new uh, the the new network pla the network plugin flag. So um, we got it working, and we got to do a big announcement. Um, and uh, Solomon announced it on stage, and then we we had um, our own session dedicated to to plugins. Um, so that's me with Jeff Lindsay and uh, our friends at Weave. So. Um, we managed to land, we didn't quite manage to land volume plugins in 1.7 stable, but volume plugins did come out in 1.8 stable. Um, and a little bit later on, uh, network plugins came out in 1.9 stable. So this is now mainline Docker. Um, you get this for free with the Docker that you've probably got, all got installed on your laptops. Um, and uh, happy days. So. Um, at this point, I'm going to switch over to, uh, to showing you some stuff. Um, that was the story about how we built this plugin mechanism. Uh, I'm now going to attempt some demos um, of things that you can actually do with Docker volume plugins. Um, and there are some cool things that you can do with Docker volume plugins. The first one I'm going to talk about um, is a project called Devol, um, which is kind of like Flocker for development. And I'll talk about more about what that means in a minute. Um, but the use case for Devol is, OK, I'm hacking away on my laptop. I'm a developer. I'm using Docker Compose. I've dockerized my application in a development environment. And um, 
wouldn't it be nice if I could treat my, uh, my development database volumes like a version control system? I've already got version control for my code, but if I need to like, share a problem that I'm having with a, with a colleague, or even just snapshot it so I can come back to it, so I can come back to it myself, it'd be great if I had like, a tool like Git, but for my development databases. So this is a, a, a use case that we're, that we're developing. Um, the, on the diagram here, we have a developer's laptop in blue. Uh, the compute and storage are in the same place because it's one physical machine. Um, and the idea is that you could have a container C1 that's pointing to um, a branch B1 of a Docker volume. And you could take a commit of it. And then you could make a new branch from that commit. And then you could add another commit to it after changing some of the data. And then uh, you could go back to the first branch and make a new branch off that first branch and make a third branch. And then you can have commit one and commit two, and then commit one and two prime. And two and two prime can differ. So the point here is that you could say, oh, I'm, I'm working on this database schema change. Oh, no, now I want to be able to go back and actually debug this other bug that someone's just asked me to come and look at. Um, and then beyond that, we, we want to add uh, push and pull capabilities to it. But, but I'll start with, with just the, the single machine demo. Um, so hopefully this mic is on. Um, is this mic on? Is this mic on? OK, cool. Um, so um, what I'm going to show you here is OK. Can everyone see the screen? Shall I make the text bigger? No, it's OK. Cool. Um, so I've got a Docker Compose file here. Um, I've also got, uh, I've got Docker running, I hope. Yeah. Um, I've got a Docker Compose file. So um, I'm going to, the Docker Compose file captures an app which consists of two containers. Um, one is a stateless application container, because 12-factor apps are great. And the other one is a stateful database or um, key value store. So we're using Redis here. And so um, the, the web container um, uh, is called Bino Carlos Moby Counter. And I'll show you what that does in a, me in a, in a second. And it's exposing a port 80. And it's got a link to the Redis container. And the Redis container, the thing that's special about this definition is that we've got this volume driver flag. So that specifies which volume plugin to use in Docker. That's the, the flag that we, that we managed to get into uh, the Docker API and the Docker CLI, and then Compose inherited it as well. Um, and uh, we can specify a volume. So the syntax that we argued quite a lot about but eventually agreed on this was um, that you could specify the name of a volume, and that that name would be um, passed along to the to the volume driver so that it could do something useful with it. Um, I've also got a command called dvol here. Um, so hopefully I cleaned up after myself earlier. Yes. Um, so dvol is that command I was talking about earlier. I'll just uh, show you the GitHub page. Um, so uh, dvol is like version control for your development databases in Docker. Um, I'll show you commit. Uh, branch and check out it basically it feels a lot like using git um, and I'll, sh I'll show you that in a second so um, I can do docker compose up minus D and that's going to spin up that docker compose file that was quick uh, and then I can do dvol list and because I specified remember the um, uh, because I specified the docker compose Oh. Because I specified the Docker Compose file with a volume driver called dvol, that's automatically on demand created uh, a dvol volume called Moby. And the thing that's special about dvol volumes is that they have branches and commits. They don't, they're not just a directory on your host. They're actually uh, more like a version control system. So I've got um, my volume Moby, uh, which is currently on branch master. And if I do a dvol log, uh, then I can see I haven't got any commits yet. So I can load up this app in my, uh, in my browser, 
and I can see I've got the app is up and running here. Um, what the app does, by the way, is um, it makes it possible to click on the screen and you'll add Docker logos, and then it persists them to the Redis database. So it's a stateful application, very sophisticated. Um, but before I click, uh, I want to make a commit of my clean state so I can come back to it. So um, here's my clean state. That's made a commit, and I can now see devol log, uh, devol branch. So we can see we're on the master branch. OK, so now I'm going to do devol checkout uh, minus b branch a. And now I can see I'm on branch A. So now if I reload the page, it's always good to reload the page, I can now draw a uh, A on the screen. And this is uh, storing the value of the locations, the pixel locations uh, in the Redis database. I have to take my word for it. So we've now got an A, um, and uh, I can do another devol commit um, and save my A state. OK. Uh, so far, so good. So far, I haven't done anything that you couldn't normally do with Docker volumes, though. Um, so let's now go back to the master branch. Uh, reload the page. OK, that's kind of interesting. We've now gone back to the clean state that we had before. Um, and I can devolve checkout minus B branch B. And devolve log will show me I'm still on my clean state. I just created a new branch from master there. And hopefully this is familiar to people. And um, then I'm going to put a B on the screen. I'm not that creative when it comes to this. I've seen people do some fairly impressive drawings with this application there. <laughs> OK, so now we've got a B state. Uh, so I'm now going to do another commit. It's not actually strictly necessary to do a commit, but it's nice to uh, record the change that you made. Um, and I can do devol log. And so now the, the kind of interesting thing you can do uh, is you can devol check out branch A. And reloading the page takes you back to the A state. And then switching back to branch B takes you to the B state. So hopefully you can sort of mentally apply this to some of the applications you're working on. Obviously, this is a trivial example because it, it's just some pictures on a screen. But if you were dealing with some sort of complicated CMS that you were developing or something like this, then it might be useful to be able to capture a specific state of your database along with the state of the code and then ship them together to QA or uh, to a, a fellow developer um, and, and sort of build up this library of snapshots uh, of your data. It might even be possible in the future to take a snapshot from production and pull it into a development environment. So imagine if a bug report uh, that would previously have been a real pain in the ass to debug because it, people never give sufficient instructions to reproduce bugs, in my experience anyway. Um, Imagine if that came with a, a snapshot of the production data, and then you could just pull it down onto a dev laptop. So that's sort of where we're going with this. This is um, sort of Flocker for development, so um, with a tool called Devol. So that's the first demo. Um, I will uh, push on because I'm, I'm OK on time. Um, so the next thing I'm going to show you is, uh, is Flocker or Flocker cluster um, with the volume hub. And so um, before I get into that, um, I'll pick up the other mic. So before I get into that, um, the, uh, I'll just give you a Flocker 101. So we talked about, I talked about solving data problems for Docker earlier in the talk. Um, but I'll be very specific here. So the very specific problem that you had with Docker out of the box was that if you start a stateful container and Docker best practices say mount a volume, um, that means uh, that the stateful container will write any changes that it makes to a directory on your host. And so that's the data volume there and the container. And the problem with that is that it means that as soon as that application writes a single byte to disk to that volume, 
it becomes impossible to move it anywhere because that data just won't be on a different machine. And so this breaks the promise of portability that you get with containers. Um, and so what Flocker does is it makes it possible to move the container and the data volume together like an atomic unit. So um, instead of uh, starting up the container on the other machine um, with nothing in its database, you can start up the container on the other machine and Flocker will make sure using whatever underlying storage mechanism is necessary um, that the volume is there uh, just like the, the container expected it to be when it was shut down or, or the first machine failed or something. Um, and just very quickly, this is a slightly confusing diagram, but we have, this is the architecture of Flocker in a swarm cluster. Um, so uh, we have a user that's talking to some orchestration thing, so maybe they're talking to Docker Swarm. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show you this in a minute. Um, and uh, then that orchestration thing is talking to the Docker daemons. Then the Flocker plugin is sitting there plugged into the Docker daemons using that interface that we fought for nine months to get four API calls. <laughs> um, and that Flocker plugin is then talking to the Flocker control service. Um, and then there are also some Flocker agents that are running on the nodes and the Flocker agents are communicating with whatever network attached block storage you have or uh, we have some experimental options for using local storage and shipping that around, and we're developing um, the ability to move around between different regions and clouds as well. But like, just for the sake of argument, let's assume these are both machines on EC2 in the same availability zone. So in that case, the Flocker agent can just detach an EBS volume from one machine and attach it to another as you move this C2, which is the, the one with the dashed line, over to, to host two. And the other thing I'll show you is uh, the Volume Hub. Um, the Volume Hub is just a web interface that's hosted by us that you can plug into your Flocker cluster um, that makes it easier to see what's going on. Um, so the use case I'm going to show you here is, OK, I've developed my application. Um, I now want to deploy it into production. And so when you go from dev to prod, like the concerns that you have change. Um, so now I'm less concerned about being able to uh, take um, do commits of my uh, of my state, and more concerned about like what happens if my server gets too busy. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't it be nice if I could move that application with its data onto another server, onto a bigger server, or if I've got two applications running on one server like this, then uh, move one of them onto a quieter server. So that's just what this diagram is meant to demonstrate. It would be great if we could move C2 from the machine that's too busy onto the machine that's quiet, and then both the machines would would have reasonable utilization. It's just a basic like sysadmin task that you might might need to be able to do. Um, so I'll give you a demo of that. Um, so um, I won't go through the entire setup process, but um, if you go to our docs, thank you, Davo, for the docs. Um, then uh, you can click the green buttons, and uh, there's an installation option for installing um, Flocker in CloudFormation on AWS, which is pretty simple. It's got a diagram. You can log in to, to CloudFormation and uh, just follow these fairly simple steps, uh, hook it up to the Volume Hub, and, and hey presto. I won't take you through that entire process because I don't have time, but um, what I will show you is the tutorial and sort of here's one I made earlier. So I've got CloudFormation here, I've got Flocker Vox demo. Um, and if I look here, if my session hadn't timed out, or has it? I was setting this up on the train, so anyway. Uh, okay, so I've got a control node IP. So there's some outputs basically in the CloudFormation template. And I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna use those outputs to connect to uh, a client node that's running on AWS. And that client node is just pre-configured with the tools that you need to do the rest of the demo. Um, so I'll show you that. <laughs> My SSH connection is still working, amazing. Um, so first thing to notice here um, is that in the volume hub, um, we've got a couple of machines, uh, those machines. And if I log into this client node, I should be able to type Docker info and What's happening here is that 
The Docker CLI on the client VM, I'll actually bring up the diagram. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the client node has Compose and the Docker CLI and a Flocker client on it. So that's, you can install those on your own machine as well. Um, and then uh, the con that's talking to the control node, which is uh, running Swarm. So we're actually talking to Swarm. And then Swarm is aggregating the agent nodes, um, so allowing you to, to see what's going on there. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing Docker info, and that's saying, hey, I'm Swarm, and I've got these two nodes. Um, and uh, so you can see that there's the node 243, and there's the node uh, 215 and uh, 243 and 215, so that matches up with Flocker's view of the world, which is good. You can see here I've got no attached volumes, no pending volumes. Uh, I've got one deleted volume because I made one earlier. So um, I'm going to just go through the tutorial that we've got here. And um, I downloaded these files earlier. So I can now, um, let me just show you the compose file. Compose file is basically the same app that we saw earlier. It's actually configured to use Postgres instead of Redis in this example, but let's gloss over that. Um, but there, it does have a constraint set up. So this is um, a swarm thing that says, please schedule this onto node one. Um, and it also has a volume driver of Flocker. So instead of dvol, uh, there's a volume driver of Flocker here. And the volume is called Postgres. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do docker compose. Uh, up minus D, but I have to give it the name of the file, so I'll cheat, just copy and paste it. And so what that's going to do is it's going to create um, Postgres volume uh, on demand. And you can see in the volume hub, hopefully, that there's now one pending volume. And the volume hub will allow you to see uh, when that volume goes from pending, it actually bounces to detached and then into attached. Because what Flocker's doing is it's configured with EBS. So it's actually going and talking to AWS and saying, hey, like, can I have a block device, please? Um, and uh, it logs all sorts of stuff. You, you can see it sort of busily provisioning that here. And now our volume is attached. So happy days. Uh, and the Docker compose up command has also completed it. It took about as long as it takes to provision an EBS volume. Um, so now I can go, and then you won't believe it, but I've deployed exactly the same app onto node 1. So I can copy the IP address for node 1 here. Uh, and OK, it's here. So um, I'll do a V for voxed. How about that? There we go. <coughs> and so I've deployed the same app. This time it's deploy. This time it's writing it into a Postgres database, but it's uh, effectively the same idea. And um, then what I'm going to do is, I'll close that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that container. So you can see the container, um, uh, the, the Swarm Compose Tutorial Postgres and Swarm Compose Tutorial Web are both visible in the, in the volume hub. And you can see that the Postgres one has this volume attached to it. And it's currently on this node which is uh, the ID for node one. Um, I'm going to move uh, the container and its volume together to the other node. And I'm going to do that by just <coughs> uh, stopping and removing the containers. So something that's really important to notice here is that, um, is that we're destroying the containers, but the volume persists. That's the whole point of stateful volumes is that they're persistent, because you don't want to lose your production data. So in this case, we can completely get rid of the, uh, yeah, that worked. Uh, we can completely get rid of the containers, um, but the volume is still going to be there. Um, so if we go to volumes, uh, then we can see it's actually this one. That's, that's still sitting around. It's still there. It's still nice and safe and visible by, uh, by Flocker. And then um, I'll just diff these files for you quickly. So you can see the difference between node 1 and node 2 files is that the node 1 file on the left um, constrains the 
uh, to the first node, constrains the containers to be scheduled to the first node, and uh, on the right, uh, constrains them to, to node two, and there's two containers, so this is duplicated twice. Um, and what we can do here is uh, spin that up. And so while that's happening, we can go back to the volume hub and we can say, well, what's, what's going on? Okay, well, we've got um, one volume currently attached. Oh, it's moved into detached. That's because Flockers unplugging it from one VM and plugging it into the other VM before the container is allowed to start up. And any second now, it should move into pending and then into attached. And we can see that completed. The web interface lags a few seconds behind. But the proof of the pudding is then, there we go. The proof of the pudding is then going to the second node and seeing if we have our V. Hey presto. Cool. Um, I'm almost out of time, um, so I will just finish off um, with a call to action. Um, you can try this on our docs, docs.clusterhq.com. Um, oh, there's another use case, which is HA, which is kind of useful. Uh, so a node fails and you reschedule the container somewhere else. I put this up as an advanced topic, but we've got a demo of how to do that um, uh, using Kubernetes on our blog. Uh, so you can just check out, just Google Cluster HQ blog and you'll, you can search for it. Um, but to summarize, like Docker plugins allow you to do some cool stuff with volumes and networking. Um, I, uh, I showed you a couple of examples of what you can do. You can also write your own plugin if you're so inclined, and there's docs on the Docker docs on how to do that. Um, so we looked at some interesting ways of doing um, container data management in a development environment um, using Docker with Docker Engine and Docker Compose combined with Devol. Um, we're going to add the ability for Devol to push and pull uh, those branches and commits that you made in development to and from the volume hub. And that will mean that you'll start to be able to collaborate with coworkers or, uh, um, or, or collaborators um, using, uh, using the Devol tool, which we think will be interesting. Um, please give me feedback. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, that Flocker allows you to um, plug any of these orchestration frameworks that you'll hear more about today, uh, Docker, CoreOS, Kubernetes, Mesos. Um, CoreOS isn't technically an orchestration framework, but it's one of those things. Um, you can combine those with, with Flocker and the Volume Hub, and then combine that with any storage that you have. So um, whether you're on AWS, we're launching GCE support soon, or if you've got any of the on-premise um, storage uh, in your data center that, that we've listed there, and there's actually a bunch more, um, then, uh, then you can now run stateful containers in production. Um, so with that, I wanted to just like get a show of hands. So who's interested in stateful containers? Cool, you came to the right talk. Um, <laughs> OK, so who would be interested in actually trying some of these tools I showed today? OK, cool. So for those people who just put their hands up, please, I beseech you, pull your phone out, just send me a one-line email, and say hi. And I'd love to just spend 30 minutes like chatting to you on a Google Hangout or on a phone call sometime. Because what we're trying to do here is learn more about people's use cases and learn about actual pain points. So if if the Devol use case didn't resonate with you, but you do have some pain point that is interesting, then I'd love to hear from you. So yeah, um, I just want to learn about what people are doing with containers. Um, pull out your phone and email me. And uh, with that, oh yeah, uh, Alice, would you like to talk about user testing? Just to add on to what Luke was saying, um, some of this stuff is very much under active development at the moment. And in the next, like, literally couple of weeks, we've got some prototypes to test out. So I'm actively requesting any of you, if you would like to get involved with user testing, we, we um, would be really happy to, to have you on board. You can come into the Bristol office, or we can do it over Google Hangouts. Um, and I'll just ask you to test out some simple tasks with the products that we have, um, which is a really valuable way for us to understand whether we're making products that are useful for you to use. So I think it's clusterhq forward slash research. Um, you can fill in form or you can, if you've got Luke's email address, you can drop him a line and he'll put you in touch with me. Um, and we, we give away some Amazon vouchers and things like that for, to say thank you for you help, helping out with us. Cool. All right, thanks, Alice. Um, and 
with that, um, that's it. So thanks very much for listening. I don't know if there's time. I'll take one question. Over here. I noticed you used a uh, custom uh, command line tool for Devol, and you used environment variables, I think, to set up something for the cluster volume thing. Yeah. Do you see a, a, a chance for the, the volumes command in Docker for plugins? Yes, definitely. Um, or is so there already an integration for that? Yeah, yeah. You can already use the uh, the Docker volume command, uh, so Docker volume create or Docker volume rm, um, to manage Flocker or Devol volumes. Um, the limitations that that have, the limitation that that has is it doesn't allow you to do any of the commit or no. branch stuff, sort of by definition. So, um, uh, so you'd need to switch to the Devol tool for that. But yeah, you can um, uh, or the or the Flocker command line for that. But yeah, uh, um, just just because I'm curious, what would I see if I do a volumes ls when I have a lot of branches in Devol? Uh, I can show you. Oh, actually, I can't show you because we haven't implemented right. list in Devol, but we have implemented it in Flocker. Okay. Um, so you'll be able to see which volumes exist. All right, thank you. Um, but just with opaque SHA-1 hashes, no more information than that. Um, but cool. Okay, my time's up, but thanks, everyone. Um, really good to see you all.